So today I have with me Delphine, who is a psychotherapist, coach, and meditation leader, and she focuses her work around um, ad- identifying the inner critic in our lives so that then we can live more of our own true life. So Delphine and I have had many discussions in this realm before, and I thought that it would be the perfect opportunity to record what she has to say, because there is so much wisdom in the work that she does. So thank you for being here today, Delphine. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Wonderful. So uh, on that note, I am going to just cut straight to the chase and probably ask you what has been pondering on my mind for a while, which is... Uh, In your opinion, why do you think that recognising, say, how we make decisions and how the inner critic plays out in our decision making, um, in our businesses and lives, like, why does it really matter that we pay attention to these things? I guess it boils down to how consciously you want to make your decisions and how authentically you want to live. So for me, it feels like a really big deal because um, a lot of the stuff that we hear about decision making, a lot of the practical tools that are out there for business owners are amazing and they sound great on paper, but in practice, if you are under the grips of your inner critic, it's just gonna get in the way all the time. It's just like this consistent, relentless voice that unless you're aware of it and aware of how it's impacting on you, is going to be making you do possibly the very opposite to what would actually be expansive and joyful and and more aligned with who you really are. Mm, Yeah, I completely agree with you there. I find that um, until we both started speaking about this together, that um, I hadn't identified resistance in my own work or maybe actions that I wanted to take in my own work as the inner critic kind of like popping its head up. And I just thought that I was stuck or sitting in inaction, you know, or mm. whatever it might be. But um, to think that then that was greatly impacting my own decision making, actually, I think is such a relief. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a, it's a really useful lens to through which to look at your your kind of early childhood conditioning, all of the adaptations that you've made, you know, to get this far in life that everybody has made. It's a completely normal process. But the inner critic is one really kind of tangible way to notice how that plays out in your life. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, not everybody knows that they have an inner critic. Some people believe they are free of the inner critic. I personally believe that we will never be free of it. It's just something that we have to live with. It's kind of like the, the personified or the voice, the inner voice, like the part of yourself that is like the subtitles or the voiceover or the personification of all of the shoulds, like all of the ways that you that you need to, that you feel or believe or were made to feel that you needed to adapt to be acceptable, likable, morally correct, you know, to be lovable, to stay connected. So it's something that's very natural. But, you know, when you're a child, that's one thing. But later in life, if you want to live a life that is actually more aligned with what you need and what you desire, it's really important to start unpicking that voice and recognizing that it's at play and hearing when it's happening and, you know, spotting it in action. Yeah, with the with recognizing the inner critic, like I I do agree that until you actually work out that that is what actually is happening. you don't understand that to some degree it's being the driver of your decision making. So what do you think or have you noticed in your own work that is a good way to recognize actually this is the true path I want to go down or this is the inner critic or maybe some conditioning or patterns that is then affecting what we decide? So I guess it depends on where, you know, where you're at as a person, because I would have been very aware of my inner critic voice, you know, growing up. It was very loud and very mean and very painful. Um, It's very connected to self-worth as well. So, and as somebody who's quite introspective and quite analytical, I would have kind of seen it at play in the the more obvious examples, not in the sneaky ones, and there's a lot of sneaky ones. Um, but maybe, I mean, to answer your question more directly, I guess it's about being connected to yourself. So being mm. self-observant. So just kind of having a sense of curiosity and inquiry and like, okay, hold on, let's, let's just see, you know, today as I go about my day, can I spot my inner critic in action? 
And some people believe that it's actually them. So that's something really important as well to highlight. Like in my work with clients, when I help them to try and like tease out which parts of themselves are actually saying things or believing things, they're like, but that's the truth or that's me. And it's like, no, that, I wonder where that actually came from. Is that true? It's like you're kind of reality testing things that feel so deeply true and so important to believe because otherwise it's like, who am I without these, these, you know, kind of controlling voices keeping me, keeping me well or so it thinks, but actually if you unpick it, it's something someone else said. It's a message you got from growing up. It's a message you got from the external culture, from the mainstream culture, from your family, from your mother and father would be the primary sources or caregivers like in school or crash or, and when you kind of look at it more closely, often you'll recognize that is the voice of my mother or my father. That's how they spoke to themselves. And because we're so porous as little babies, we just literally like sponge in, sponge up and download directly the inner critics of our early caregivers. So there's like a lot of layers to it. So yeah, it's, it's like when you just observe yourself about your day, you know, there can be this constant inner monologue that you might not be so aware of at first, or you might be. And it's just saying things to you like, oh, why'd you do that? Oh, you idiot. Or, you know, it's calling you names. It's, it's quite insidious because it's like, actually, no, you're not an idiot. You just were, you know, trying to do too many things at once. Or it's just starting to kind of check in, in your head first, I guess, would be a good start. Mm -hmm. And then checking in with your body and noticing how do you feel when you, you know, say really mean things to yourself about how you parked or how you always do this or you shouldn't be doing that. So starting to kind of really get curious about your inner landscape, I guess. Mm, I think um, when I think about my own self, that for me, it's the feeling of that's not good enough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How could I so do that? That's not good enough. A, yeah. The feeling, which is such a horrible feeling of not being good, you know, it's being either too much or not enough. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what sentences accompany that? You know, there's often a lot of shoulds in there. It's like, you should be more like this or you shouldn't do that. There's a, there's a yeah. lot of should in our critics. Yeah. And I've also noticed with clients, I guess to some degree, it comes out as in can't. Oh, but I can't do that because, yeah. you know, whatever it might be like, say the recommendation might be that the, the average price of something needs to increase. I can't because... Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. and then the the excuses come and it might be um you know like like it could be anything and you're just like mm -hmm. I actually don't agree with you there you know like or I wouldn't have made the recommendation and then I guess in other ways sometimes um it is in like it plays out in being that idea around inaction like it stops us from really doing things mm. or um sometimes I feel confused it's like I then have maybe, t is it possible to have two inner critics or two conversations or a dialogue yeah. going on? Yeah. Multiple voices in there. And they're all trying to keep someone else happy and keep you therefore lovable and likable and connected. But yeah, yeah, it's possible for multiple ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I definitely can see that some of the things that people say or decisions that are made are as if it's a, a definite truth, like you mentioned. That's exactly it. but this is the truth this is exactly how it happens and you're like mm, that's not the case i can provide you with a lot of other examples over here yeah. of where it occurs in a different way so yeah so that's where like you know that's why i think it's so important that you really get this that you have a lot of practical tools that can kind of help challenge the inner critic because you're like but here's the reality <laughs> so yeah. i know when you were talking before about finances and pricing i was kind of like hold on a minute she's she's speaking the truth here but the bit that's kind of to close the gap it's like there's a really emotional component to i couldn't possibly do that because it's like what are the stakes you know the stakes feel really really high um because they were really really high as a child they're probably kind of survival level stuff mm. so that's another thing about the inner critic it's like not to make yourself wrong for being for having an inner critic you know because that shows up in layers it's like oh, i can't believe i you know it's, it's kind of always there criticizing yourself for criticizing yourself for, for not being good enough yeah so it sneaks into everything it sneaks into like spiritual practice and you know self-improvement it's like i'm not a good enough client i'm not i'm not good enough in my own personal evolution you know but yeah the stakes are really high because it's very tied up in early childhood stuff essentially so i'm picking it consciously as an adult entails a process of like grief a lot of the time there's a hugely emotional component 
So, you know, like I, I would say the first line of defense is, is kind of cognitive, like, you know, mentally engaging with it and going, hold mm -hmm. on a minute, separating it out and seeing it for what it is. This is not necessarily the truth. Let's just check this and test this for truth. And then you can reach a certain amount of kind of, you know, that's a good first line defense and it's an ongoing practice. But then there's the emotional component and the kind of grieving of, wow, I adapted that much or I suffered in that way. And so it's kind of grieving who you were and who you had to adapt into. So there's a huge amount of grief work, I believe, associated with the inner critic. It's not just as simple as just do it. <laughs> it's like if it was that simple, we'd all be acing, at, you know, winning at life. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of grief work, you know. Um, there's actually, uh, there was a, a thing that came up in Elizabeth Gilbert's Big Magic, just when we were talking about doing this interview, and I was like, oh my God, this is so like appropriate. And the way she talks about it is, um, she talks about a lot about her journey with her inner critic and how it's an ongoing commitment yeah. in her life, you know? And I love how she talks about it. So she says, over time, I found the right tone of voice for these assertions To These are the assertions that say, you know, you can't be creative or, or else, you know, horror will ensue. It's best to be insistent, but affable. Repeat yourself, but don't get shrill. Speak to your darkest and most negative interior voices the way a hostage negotiator speaks to a violent psychopath. <laughs> Calmly, but firmly. And most of all, never back down. You can't afford to back down. The life you're negotiating to save, after all, is your own. So I just thought that was so, like such a great summary of, I kind of call it the calm but firm parent. It's kind of like reparenting yourself and going, okay, Thanks for trying to protect me and recognizing, you know, how your inner critic was trying to mind you and keep you from shame or from exclusion. It's yeah. like, don't say that thing in that group or you'll be, you know, shamed. So, you yeah. know, I get it. Yeah. But right now I have other resources. I'm an adult now. I can take care of myself and I'm going to go out of my comfort zone. So it's like, thanks for being there, but shut up. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, I'm going to still keep moving forward. And, um, and I love how she describes that because it's, it, you know, it is a violent psychopath sometimes. Our inner critic can be horrendous. You know, if you think about all the worst things that you've said to yourself in your, in your internal monologues, it's like probably we wouldn't want to admit on this interview, you know, in this, in this conversation, just how bad it has got, you know? And, and I'm happy to say that my inner critic is less, way less violent nowadays and way less shaming. Mm -hmm. More like, oh, you know, it's like, I, you know, how terrible that I suffered those things as being true when they weren't even true. Yep. But, um, but it's there and it's sneaky. It shows up much more. It sneaky. definitely is. Like I was thinking about my own business journey and I don't think that there's a pivotal point obviously where it didn't show up, you know, in deciding yeah. to leave a good corporate job when it just came straight up, you know, you're just like, yeah. yep, why would you do that? And then actually going and setting about um, setting up, business what are things going to look like how are you going to speak how are you going to put your information out there um, I even noticed uh, in the beginning when trying to work out the best way to assist clients like I had gone from working in a company where we dealt with profit over 200 million so our budgets were in the billions and I would be doing some work for a client that might be, you know, under a million dollars or even, you know, it could be under a hundred thousand dollars. And my inner critic would come up to be like, who do you think you are to do yeah. this work? And then I would that's, definitely that's have to take that step back and be like, Linda, you've done this on much bigger scales. Yeah. So you need, that needs to shush, shush. It's like shush, shush, not listening to you yeah. because this is just some, for me, I used to refer to it as resistance, which I think is now that I'm becoming more uh, educated around the inner critic is a different thing. I used to think that I was just being resistant to doing the work or whatever, but now I can completely see that that little voice that was piping its head up at each kind of pivotal, pivotal point along the way to some degree was my inner critic and it was keeping me either in indecision or um, trying to, to some degree, I guess you could say, keep you small. It's just like, it's yeah. easier to hide away and not have to do this. But then I guess the, the opposite of that is then going, but I want what's on the other side of this. I want to be able to help small business financially thrive, or I want to be able to create a life where I no longer um, 
have each aspect of what I do dictated to me. Um, so it's almost like then you, to some degree, have to learn how to manoeuvre and work with the inner critic. Otherwise, you won't get to that, that life that you're desiring. Mm. And so I can see it in myself and I can see it in clients as well, that it probably, to some degree, comes up at the most important point. Exactly. Each kind of stretch point or growth point, it's like, ping, there it is. Yeah. You know, when you got this far and we're still safe, but don't be doing the next, don't expand again, because that's like way too, you know, you don't deserve it or that is too greedy or that's too selfish or, you know, it's just, it's different things for different people. Yeah. But it's kind of like, some of it is resistance, you know, it's resistance to growth. It's kind of fear, fear of the unknown. We're hardwired mm -hmm. to stay you know, safe and secure. But I think the inner critic is like that particularly kind of moralistic tone that, you know, evolves like around age sort of two, three, four to keep you, you know, connected to society, connected to your family. And it, it but it's really mean because it makes you wrong, you know, it makes you wrong. And it keeps you small, as you say, like it keeps you from desiring things, from wanting more. It's constantly putting you back in, you know, get you back in your box kind of a voice. Mm -hmm. and uh, and it's exhausting yeah and, and as you say you would never like we none of us would ever do anything in life if we were constantly listening to our inner critic we'd be just like <laughs> i don't know like at home you know in bed rocking and kind of you know it's so debilitating if you actually listen to it so it's a daily thing to get up and and it definitely happens as you identified in those kind of big expansion points yeah you know it's kind of like well you don't be don't be wanting too much you know, like for me, it comes up more around things like joy now. It used to be a lot more not being good enough, not being correct, you know, needing to do things perfectly. And it was just kind of constantly censoring everything I said or did, like organically in a group. I could never just be myself in a group. It was always censoring anything I delivered, anything that came out of my mouth was pre checked and rechecked yeah. by yeah. my inner critic. And now it's more around joy. It's like, well, don't be looking too, you know, that's kind of maybe a very Irish thing as well, possibly Australian. It's like, don't, don't be too delighted with yourself <laughs> because you'll be, you know, socially rejected. You'll, people will think you you're an idiot. You get smacked down. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, what is more organic than just, you know, joy in the moment? And, and then it gives other people permission to also move past their inner critics. Yes. I've noticed, um, like you were saying with the joy thing is that um, there is definitely a common behavior in some small business owners that are quite holistic or they're um, I guess you could call solopreneurs or freelancers where as soon as they start to be earning money more freely, their inner critic comes up and almost starts shaming them. There's Who do you wrong. think you are that you yeah. could earn money this easily? It can't be this easy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's about deserving and worth. Yeah, it's tied up with self-worth and there's a lot of complexity to it. But the critic is that voice part that says those things. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. How you can yeah. spot it. Or even um, I do a lot of forecasting and planning with business owners so that they can truly sit down and think about what they desire or what they want and then work out how they can create a business to be able to get to that point because I think that it's really important that we create this container, you know, the size of the life that we want to live, that the money and um, offerings that we create can funnel into. So yeah. one thing I find really interesting is that a lot of people, there's another like group of people that get stuck at that very first point. What is it that you really want or desire? Mm -hmm. And then as soon as they want more than just their basic survival needs of good housing, mm -hmm. shelter, you know, yeah. a respectable car, um, then they get to that point, like not many people will sit there and be like, oh, I want that $2 million house with the, you know, even yeah. if it is that thing that they want, or if they want an overseas holiday every year, it then is almost like an act of denial. Oh, but I've got yeah. enough now. So that would have been shaped, you know, in, in the early years, it's kind of like you don't, you shouldn't want too much. You shouldn't be greedy, you know? Yeah. So children's desires needs that we have and that gets into a little bit of inner child stuff as well yeah that we all desire to be seen and valued you know and, and recognized and make a difference like what about not just survival level stuff but thriving and the inner critic is probably going to keep you at survival level you know if you listen to it yes yeah really i think that's well. a really interesting point to make that if you are constantly stuck at survival point then there is a good chance that there is something at play that is not yeah. allowing you to thrive yeah 
Yeah. So this is fantastic, but I don't want to keep you too long. So I okay. would actually love, yes, yes, we could talk for hours about this stuff, but mm. I guess probably um, I would love to hear some of your practical wisdom, some takeaways as such of how we could, you know, coexist with our inner critic, because like you said, it's probably not going to go away, but how can we have it not completely impact our finance? financial or business or life decision making so that then we truly can build out this life that we want yeah and live more authentically and joyfully yeah. um, so first of all i would say there's probably not a one size fits all in in real terms so i would you know when i work with people i start with where they're at and whatever's showing up and that's how you kind of follow the the trail back to back home but um kind of overall guidance would be um work with it first of all like you were you know, giving examples like kind of mentally, like respond to it, dialogue with it, you know, fight back. That's the first line of defense is kind of fight back with the violent psychopath in a calm, measured kind of, okay, we're going to just like take it down a notch here and really stay solid in that. So really kind of commit to consciously, you know, answering back and just see how that, how that, how that feels over it. Like try it for a day or two days or three days and see what shows up and what situations it really flares up. So, yeah, you know, respond cognitively and consciously to the degree that you can see it in action. And then I would say presence in the here and now. So like coming back into more of an embodied out of your head, in your body, in the here and now, getting out of like the past and the future kind of, you know, worries into like what is true here in the moment. So the more connected to yourself you are and your desires, like your body, your emotions, the more you know yourself kind of. The more, more present you can be with yourself in the here and now, that's a much more empowering kind of springboard for, for action that is actually genuinely aligned with what you need. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, and, and I believe, you know, that it involves grieving past losses, feeling your feelings and, and really large doses of self-compassion like that. That's been my biggest learning in the last year. And that can sound trite and people are like, yeah, whatever compassion, you know, is really, really, really important and true. Like the last layer of work is kind of like it's sending yourself love it's like i'm so sorry that you suffered in that way it's not just a cognitive you know thing it's it's coming from a place of kindness and love and forgiveness and and grieving the losses that you've had to endure at the hands of the inner critic and and all your you know the childhood experiences that you've had so it's really reparenting yourself and befriending yourself is the best way to ultimately annihilate the inner critic is like if you're dolloping it you know dolloping such large doses of self-love your way then it's kind of like your teflon (laughs) to the attacks because it's like i don't care because i love myself so much so i'm going to just keep doing this because it's good for me you know so i think that's a really strong ultimate antidote but it's a journey it's not an easy one and it takes commitment you know yes yeah it does and i think that we just have to be aware that it does take time and it takes recognition um, that it's happening. Sometimes it takes someone pulling you up on it or just helping you recognize yeah. that this is what's happening. I think in my case for a long time, it was a friend pulling me up around yeah. understanding what was happening because I was so oblivious to it. Um, That's a really important point, actually. People who know you well and see the ways that you typically keep yourself small or are mean to yourself. Mm-hmm. you know that you can't see that's a really lovely point you know that to, to maybe even ask people to be helping you with it you know to, to stop you from staying stuck yep. yeah yeah definitely it, it was absolutely wonderful having you sit down with me today and record this Likewise, i always love our chats <laughs> yes is there any resources or anything that you uh, would like to share that maybe people could go to to check out any more information so I don't have anything specific on the inner critic, but after yep. all our conversations, I'm definitely going to be, you know, produce, writing some stuff about yes. it and maybe make some videos about it. So for now, I guess my Facebook page, which is Embody mm-hmm. My Truth, is probably the best like repository of stuff that I've shared or yep. articles and resources that are useful on this kind of thing. And you have a uh, YouTube channel? I thank you. <laughs> my inner critic is like, don't mention that because it's not perfect. And I only just started it. It's definitely not perfect. But yeah, I'm hopefully going to be producing more stuff and just spontaneously and imperfectly talking about these topics. So watch the space and I will, under Linda's um, insistence and guidance, I'll be producing some bits and pieces on the inner critic in the coming Yes, 
I definitely think you should. And I will link your channel to below this video when I pop it up. Um, and Delphine, I just, I can't thank you enough. This has been wonderful. Thanks so much. Yeah, I look forward to talking again.